Great, while people keep arriving, I'll just begin with some housekeeping. So hello everyone, my name is Nermi and I'm a PhD student at the Cambridge Institute of Music Therapy Research. And I would like to thank you all for joining us today. Um, and we are really pleased to welcome Janine Bauer to speak with us. And this is a webinar hosted by the Cambridge Institute for Music Therapy Research. I'm just going to quickly introduce you to some of our Zoom webinar features. Firstly, only speakers can share their audio and video. So attendees can go to the chat to introduce yourselves and say where you're from. Um, and you can also use the Q&A function to ask any questions and you can use this to upvote questions from other attendees. Um, and some of these will be answered within the Q&A function and some questions will be put um, to Janine at the end of the presentation. If you are using social media, please use the hashtag, hashtag SymptaWebinar and follow us on Twitter at Symptor underscore ARU. After the webinar, we will also link you to our survey. Please do fill this out and this helps us inform our future events. Great, so I'm now going to hand over to Professor Helen O'Dell Miller to introduce the webinar. Hello to everybody. Um, um, this is a great moment because it's the beginning of our new academic year. So it's the beginning of a new lecture series at Anglia Ruskin University, hosted by um, our research institute, as Naomi already said. And um, thank you, Naomi, and thank you to all the people who um, enable us to be able to deliver these public lectures, um, especially managing the online services. Um, we've decided to stay online because um, we have a big reach um, by doing that. So welcome to people I can see um, from all over the world, from many different countries. Um, just before we begin, I'd also like to give a special welcome to all the new students, to all students who are um, studying everywhere around the world. Um, it's it's very exciting but, um, to meet with you virtually and for you to be able to come to the lectures and a special welcome to those at ARU, Anglia Ruskin University. Um, we have many different courses across health education and medicine and um, we're in a faculty of arts, health and social sciences and um, we have in particular linked to this series, Music Therapy and Drama Therapy Master Students. And in Simpta, we have about 20 at any one time PhD students as well. So a really warm welcome to you all. Um, in case it's your first time coming to a Simpta event, um, we are a large research institute um, focused on music therapy and we specialize in five particular areas, but we also have some studies like, for example, a long COVID study at the moment, which might fall slightly outside our main areas. But the main areas um, where we're undertaking research, often in partnership with people in other countries and certainly um, with health and community populations um, who are interested or who are um, participants in our in music therapy across healthy aging and dementia, music therapy and neuroscience, neuro rehabilitation and stroke, mental health. And I think this lecture particularly fits with our children, young people and families um, area. And I really 
I'm very pleased to see you again and welcome um, Janine Bauer, all the way from Australia, um, who um, is a music therapy team lead and senior clinician at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne. And she's over 15 years of clinical experience as a music therapist in acute paediatrics, including work in neurocritical care and many other areas, neurorehabilitation, acute neuropalliative care. She's also a PhD candidate nearing the end of her studies at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute and in conjunction with the University of Melbourne, Australia, which we also have very close collaborations with on many different research projects. Um, her research, she will tell you about, explores the use of familiar song to support increased arousal and awareness in children presenting with an acute disorder of consciousness and includes the use of steady state EEG to describe potential covert responses to music. So we have um, a lot of in common areas, but without further ado, I welcome Janine. I want to tell you all that um, Janine, it's three o'clock in the morning, roughly, in uh, where Janine is living and she's pre-recorded her talk just to avoid any um, middle of the night online difficulties, <laughs> but is here in person remotely and will um, be back for the Q&A session at the end of the lecture. So over to you, Naomi and Janine. Hello, and thank you for inviting me to present today. Um, I have pre-recorded this presentation because 5.30 p.m. in the UK is currently 3.30 a.m. Um, in Melbourne, Australia. So I thought you would get a better presentation if I recorded it at a slightly different time. But I am here in person, so I will answer questions at the end of the presentation. Today, I'm presenting the results of a systematic review that was undertaken as part of my PhD research with my supervisors, Professors Felicity Baker, Wendy McGee and Cathy Katropa. So my supervisors are co-authors on the review and I would like to acknowledge their enormous input into the systematic review and also their ongoing support throughout my PhD. The music therapists in the audience are probably um, familiar with Felicity and Wendy, or at least familiar with their work. Um, Felicity and Wendy are both professors of music therapy, and Cathy Katropa is a senior research fellow at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute, and she is a developmental and educational psychologist. So the fact that three out of four of the authors of the review are music therapists contextualizes some of the interpretations that I will present in a little bit. Today, I'm going to provide some brief background information about why we undertook this review, the actual process of undertaking a systematic review, and then the outcomes of the review, um, and how this might be applied for clinical populations specific to children with acquired brain injuries. So this is the Royal Children's Hospital Melbourne, um, where I am team lead and senior clinician. And I have worked at the Children's Hospital on and off for almost 20 years as a clinician. Um, the Royal Children's Hospital Melbourne is the major paediatric trauma centre in the state of Victoria. And for children who sustain a severe acquired brain injury, music therapy is standard clinical care. So this, this provides some of the context as to how, I, how I've become interested in studying music in the brain um, and the relevance for children with acquired brain injuries. So at RCH, we start working with children very early in their recovery, often within days of them sustaining an acquired brain injury while they're in intensive care. We work with them throughout their acute neurologic admission and then into subacute neurorehabilitation. Um, and the subacute rehab bed card is co-located in the acute hospital. Um, as a children's hospital, we are fortunate to have a two-story aquarium, which is beautiful. We also have a meerkat enclosure, so that's quite fun. Um, but I'm going to start with a quick case example to provide some, some of the, the insight into the interest in the topic. So Samantha, not her real name, was admitted to the RCH with a severe brain injury and multiple orthopedic injuries. She suffered a severe traumatic brain injury and had an initial period of coma 
followed by a period of post-traumatic amnesia as she was emerging from coma. So during PTA, post-traumatic amnesia, she was confused, agitated, disoriented, and aggressive. These, this is not an uncommon presentation for children um, in post-traumatic amnesia. On this particular day, I entered her room wearing a pink cardigan, and that's a quirky but important part of the story. Um, and when I entered her room, she was bum shuffling around the room on her external hip fixator. So um, in the accident, she had sustained such severe pelvic and hip damage that they had to um, pin the bones from the outside. So she was shuffling on her bum on this external hip fixator, screaming in pain, but so confused and disoriented that she was not aware she was in fact causing her own pain. I started singing her favorite song with guitar accompaniment and she immediately responded. So she sort of stilled and then I was able to encourage her to sing along by leaving off um, the end of the phrase. So leaving off the last couple of words of the lyric. So as she started to sing along, I slowed the pace of her singing and together we regulated her breathing and she fairly quickly settled to sleep. I was able to, to direct her back to her bed. As I was leaving her room, I turned just to look at her and I banged my guitar on the door on the way out, which was enough to wake her up. Um, but at this point she made eye contact with me and she looked at me and she said, do you know where my iPod is? It's big and it's pink and it was singing to me. So I had a bit of a giggle about that, that she thinks I'm her iPod, but I um, continued singing her favorite songs and she quickly settled back to sleep. And the nurses reported that she stayed asleep for four or five hours after that session. So it's cases like Samantha that have led me to be really interested in understanding why music might be one of the first experiences that children with a severe brain injury respond to, because Samantha wasn't responding to just spoken word. There was lots of encouragement from nursing staff and family staff. She wasn't able to process that in a way that was, was meaningful and useful to her, but she did respond almost instantaneously to familiar song. So this has led to an interest in understanding how children's brains might process music and then how we can use this knowledge in clinical work, particularly for children who have a brain injury. This has then led to further research and a systematic review, which I'm going to discuss very shortly. Um, a couple of very quick definitions before I go on. Um, I'm not quite sure how familiar everybody is with these terms. So an acquired brain injury, an ABI, is an umbrella definition for any insult to the brain that occurs after the immediate postnatal period. So brain injuries that occur in the perinatal or up to about four weeks post birth are classified differently. After that period, um, they are classified as an acquired brain injury. And ABI, um, the definition includes traumatic brain injuries. So traumas that is um, uh, where there's an external force to the child's head, usually in something like a car accident or a sporting injury or falling out of trees, um, stroke, a stroke in a child will cause an ABI. There are hypoxic or anoxic events as well as um, viral type encephalopathic um, brain injuries. A disorder of consciousness is common following a severe brain injury in children. And it's a spectrum of states where there's profoundly reduced consciousness following a severe brain injury. It um, uh, DOC results from an interruption in the complex interplay between arousal and awareness. And it includes the definitions of coma, unresponsive wakefulness syndrome, which is often referred to as VS or vegetative Hello, everybody. Um, so some of us can see the video, but I gather not everybody can. So I just wondered if it can be relaunched and we can see if the uh, so at the beginning, it was very clear, Janine, we could see you. And, um, then certainly in my delivery, it became a bit blurred. We don't know why at the moment. So apologies. I really want to apologize to everyone. Um, we're doing our best here to sort the technology out. Um, does anyone have any <laughs> ways of um, also getting rid of the block that was sometimes blocking the view? Hi, Naomi, do we have the um, YouTube link? I don't think there was a YouTube link. Um, <laughs> But I can try, I'll try resharing. And if not, yeah. Kira, you have the mm -hmm. slides as well and the video. Um, 
So we'll try okay. that. Apologies. Great. Thank you. These things do happen and people can be thinking of your questions. Um, you should, yeah, we can see that people can put Q&A. Um, you can put questions in the Q&A already. Yeah, so that's very clear for me. So I hope it's clear for all of you now. Um, Thank you, Nisha. Um, into a minimally conscious state and then progressing into consciousness. Most children do emerge beyond a DOC um, and progress through coma, UWS and minimally conscious um, to, to progress to um, a rehabilitative phase. Most of the work I've done and all of the research that I'm, I'm doing at the moment uh, is in the acute disorder of consciousness phase. So that's within the first four weeks of the child sustaining their brain injury. So very early in their recovery. Uh, when working clinically with neuropopulations, um, a lot of the work we do is heavily influenced by what we know about how music is processed in the brain. Um, this mostly comes from adult models. So for example, melodic intonation therapy can be very successful with people who have aphasia as a result of a left-sided brain injury. And in this instance, we apply knowledge that for most right-handed adults, a lot of melody processing is lateralized to the right hemisphere of the brain whilst language is left lateralized. So the ability to sing remains intact despite an impaired, uh, sorry, despite an impaired ability to speak. From adult models, we know that there is no one music center of the brain and that music is processed throughout a complex bilateral network. So both hemispheres of cortical and subcortical structures. The more specific neural activation will depend on the exact musical task. So singing, playing an instrument, or just listening will all have different neural activations. But because of the global processing we observe when listening to music, there's a really strong argument that some ability to meaningfully process music will remain intact even in individuals who have a significant brain injury. We also know that throughout the lifespan, our brain is shaped by our experiences. So this is the process of neuroplasticity. It makes sense that our exposure to music, whether it's formal through musical expertise and musical training or informal, just listening every day, will shape our brain processes and how our brain processes music. But um, there is some difficulty in applying adult theories to babies and children. Um, we know this is problematic because children haven't had, uh, children and certainly infants haven't had the same experience brain development that adults have had. So in a lot of the literature in the field of music therapy and neurosciences, we tend to just adopt adult theories for paediatric populations, largely because we don't have the evidence in children. There's a plethora of reasons for why we don't have the evidence in children. Um, young children make notoriously difficult research subjects. There's a lot of ethical complications around uh, researching children, particularly children with brain injuries who are a particularly vulnerable population. But, it's complex because we know that children's brains are not just a smaller version of an adult's brain and infancy and childhood are periods of rapid growth and development. So even though a child's brain grows to almost an adult size by quite a young age, the shape and tissue composition of their brain is enormously different to an adult's brain. In typical development, neuroplasticity is beneficial. Um, so the brain responds to sensory information and grows and adapts in response to this. But this is really relevant in the neurorehabilitation, paediatric neurorehabilitation field, because there's strong evidence that young children's brains are especially susceptible to, to a severe brain injury, and that a severe brain injury can result in a devastating disruption to the processes of neuroplasticity. And in some cases, the full range of deficits may not be evident until many years after the insults, when developmental milestones are missed, or there's a delay in the development of complex social or cognitive capabilities. This is often referred to as children growing into their deficits. The age of insult, the nature of the brain insult and environmental factors all contribute to the recovery of children following brain injury. And I've discussed this just very briefly to highlight the need for additional considerations when designing interventions for children with an acquired brain injury, specifically those with a disorder of consciousness. Even when the interventions may on the surface appear to be very low risk, like a music-based intervention. 
So for these reasons, we thought it was necessary to explore how children process music and how this knowledge may or indeed may not support the use of music for children who sustain and acquire brain injury. Uh, an additional consideration and an additional complexity in exploring music processing in these children is that babies and very young children obviously can't describe to us what their lived experience of music is. So we took a step back from lived experience and looked at brain processing. That's not to say there is a direct brain behaviour link. We absolutely know it's not that simple. But we decided to undertake this systematic review. So there's the title and, and the publication details. Sorry, I'm pointing over there. My second screen is over there. Um, the systematic review is available through Frontiers in Psychology if anybody's interested in having a thorough read. There is excellent behavioural evidence supporting that infants and young children's um, ability are for musical processing and also that infants actually have a preference to music over some, some instances of speech. The data from the review was analysed using, uh, sorry, synthesised using Pope and colleagues' guidance on how to conduct a narrative synthesis. We weren't able to conduct a meta-analysis given the range of data we were looking at um, and also the nature of it being brainy. Um, imaging data, not statistical data. Also, given that three of the four authors are music therapists, the interpretation and discussion of the data was centred around the information that we believe would be most relevant for clinical practice for children with an acquired brain injury. The central question of the systematic review was, what does brain imaging data reveal about the receptive processing of music in children? That's a bit of a mouthful. It is again published in the, um, in the review. So the intention of undertaking a systematic review as opposed to another type of review, like a narrative re review, was to be really thorough and systematic in the way we searched for publication to reduce the bias in this and reduce the chances that we would miss publications, but also to be really transparent in our process of analysis analysis and interpretation. We very briefly, um, to describe the method of the systematic review, we searched the main databases with help of a research librarian to develop the search strategies. I cannot recommend strongly enough working with a research librarian if you are thinking of undertaking a systematic review. They are truly brilliant at doing this. Um, I've included this, uh, this is part of our Medline search strategy. This was the first 13 lines of a uh, 23 line search strategy. Um, and there were adaptations of the search strategy for each database. So again, um, this is the, where the expertise of research librarians is really valued. We searched the main databases and retrieved 3,520 references. We then removed duplicate references and downloaded titles and abstracts only into an Excel document. Each title and abstract was reviewed by two of the authors against the inclusion and exclusion criteria that we had developed. Um, and this was to determine inclusion in a full text review. If there was a disagreement between the two reviewers about inclusion, the title and abstract were reviewed by a third author. Then we had a list of 175 references um, that appeared to meet the inclusion criteria. So we downloaded the full text articles and each of the full text articles were again reviewed by two authors and a third author in the instance of a disagreement. At this point, we also hand searched the reference lists of the included full text articles and, and identified an additional five um, articles that met our inclusion criteria. So we ended up with a total of 46 articles that met our inclusion criteria, and we included both electrical and hemodynamic brain imaging methods. So we included all of the brain imaging methods available to us in the current, um, current literature. Electrical methods um, are like auditory evoked potentials, which are recorded using an EEG apparatus, or like MEG, um, which also captures uh, an electric field. Um, and electric methods capture a direct brain response because the brain activity is electrical activity. We also included the hemodynamic methods like fMRI um, or FNIRS, functional near infrared spectroscopy. And fMRI and FNIRS capture the blood oxygenation response that occurs secondary to the electrical activity. So this makes them an indirect measure of brain activity. As you can see, the majority of the studies we included used EEG followed by fMRI. Um, I think this talks to um, undertaking research with, with children and how um, easy or not easy it is to collect data. Uh, 
having children undertake an fMRI requires that they lie very still for long periods of time. So that, of course, is quite complex, whereas EEG is more forgiving with movement artifacts. So whilst 46 is a fairly large number of studies to include in the systematic review, overall it does indicate that there is a very limited amount of evidence in the field of music um, neurosciences and describing how children process music. All of the included studies were published within the last 20 years at the time of publication um, and included publication, uh, sorry, and included participants who were neurotypically developing and neurologically healthy who had not received formal music tuition. This is because we know that musical expertise results in really significant neuroplastic, neuroplastic changes. And we wanted to capture a normative sample of data given that we know very little about how children process music um, we understand and we anticipate that um, neurologic differences may result in differences in the way children process music. So at this point, we haven't explored that yet. As part of the synthesis, we developed a timeline of significant milestones in musical processing. And I will run through this briefly um, now, an outline of this timeline. At full term birth, which is from 37 weeks gestation, babies process music throughout most of their brains. So this includes both cortical hemispheres and into the subcortical structures. This included activation at the core emotional centers of the limbic system, which means that infants are having an emotional response to music, although it's likely a sensory emotional response because they won't yet have the memory connections to music in the way that we as adults would have. Electrical responses were recorded in infants um, in response to pitch, rhythm, beat, interval, and tonal changes. But it's really important to note that these responses occurred more slowly and actually used more brain tissue than similar responses recorded in adults. They were also recorded in slightly different areas of the brain in babies compared to adults. Often it was just adjacent, just next to where the adult processing occurred. Babies' brains also displayed sensitivity to major and minor tonalities and consonants and dissonance. But the responses um, likely indicate that the babies were just recognising a difference, not that they were displaying a preference to consonants or dissonance, again, in ways that we would expect in adults. They do nonetheless indicate that the babies have the basic capacity for melody and beat perception. Six months of age appears to be a developmentally significant period for musical processing. And at this age, a number of the specific, specific electric responses to various musical components became more adult-like. So they began to um, occur more quickly and more efficiently, but they are still not fully mature. Also at about six months of age, infants displayed a high voice preference in um, stimuli where different tones were presented simultaneously. That's possibly worth considering if you are a music therapist working with infants who uses a harmonic um, accompaniment to some of your singing. The results of the included studies also indicated that responses to more complex stimuli take longer to mature. So the responses to single tones matures more quickly than responses to intervals or music that has harmonic components. Developmentally, this really makes sense. It means the children, the babies, are learning to musically walk before they musically run. Throughout the toddler and childhood years, there is evidence of an exposure effect, which is the brain changing through experience or neuroplastic changes. But it's important to note here again that this experience is not specific to intentional music training, as we would see with, say, piano lessons. Rather, it's just exposure in everyday life. It's interesting to note that in children, there is a greater overlap of music and language processing than what is observed in adults. So as I mentioned briefly, when I described melodic intonation therapy, in right-handed adults, there is a strong left lateralization of language and a right lateralization of melody processing. Current imaging data suggests this is less evident in children, particularly in younger children. And some elements of musical processing occur more in the left hemisphere than they do in adults. In this age group, there is also a significant development of the pre-conscious understanding of Western music syntax. It's a bit of a mouthful, but it's the rules that govern Western tonal music, like expecting a dominant seventh chord to resolve to a tonic. Um, implicitly, we know when this happens, we feel the sense of resolution as opposed to an unexpected harmony where it creates a sense of anticipation. 
This is, of course, specific to children who are enculturated to Western tonal music, and it was beyond the scope of this particular review to explore music from other cultures. A number of the electrical responses to music are still immature in this age group and immature responses to complex rhythms compared to adults were also observed. A lot of the ways the electrical brain responses were processed probably reflects an overall immaturity of the child's cortex. So the auditory brain stem and subcortical pathways are quite mature from birth and from very early infancy, but the higher processing remains immature. There were actually very few studies published that fit our criteria in the 13 to 18 year age cohort. Um, we did classify older than 18 as an adult and that relates to the Australian um, context and uh, children or young people older than 18 are typically treated in an adult healthcare service in Australia. A lot of the electrical responses to music-based stimuli by this age are adult-like, using similar brain areas to adults and occurring at a similar speed using a similar amount of brain tissue. Although one study did report that a competing auditory stimulus negatively impacted, impacted electrical brain responses in adolescents in a way that wasn't observed in adults. Again, this probably relates to the developing attentional capabilities of adolescents. I think the most important thing for us to discuss and to, to consider is actually what does all of this information mean for clinical applications of music and clinical practice for music therapists. So the data from the included studies absolutely supports that the ability to process music is present from birth and that complex musical abilities are developed effortlessly throughout through exposure. Babies' brains display the fundamental responses to changes in pitch, which forms the basis of melody processing, and changes in beat, which form the basis of rhythm. But this processing is quite different to what occurs in the adult brain. It is slower, it is less efficient, and it uses different brain areas. It also takes many, many years for it to fully develop. The speed of transmission of the electrical responses, the electrical impulses throughout the brain does occur in hundreds of seconds. So we're not talking about um, the, the slower processing being massive amounts of time, but we do need to consider that music transmission being less efficient in children may mean that it requires additional effort. So we know that children have short attention spans. Uh, certainly any parents who were involved in homeschooling children during the global pandemic are very aware of this. But it's really important to consider that the length of musical experiences for children, specifically children with an acquired brain injury, may lead to overstimulation or significant cognitive fatigue. We already know that brain injuries negatively impact cognitive processing and processing speed. And so we do need to consider the pacing and the duration of our musical interactions with these children and watch for signs of fatigue and overstimulation very carefully. But we also know that the global processing of music means that music really is an ideal sensory stimulus because the ability to process music will likely remain intact even in instances of quite severe brain um, insult. I think here is where a really thorough assessment is essential because depending on the age of the child and the location of their brain injury, which musical elements remain intact and will be most accessible to the child will vary. It may be that they respond most positively to rhythmic based interventions, um, or it might be melody, or it might be melody with lyrics, or it might be lyrics with or without harmonic accompaniment. So we do need to assess for all of these aspects when working with very neurologically vulnerable populations. If you are aiming to increase arousal, um, you may want to provide a richer stimulus for a shorter period of time, knowing that a richer stimulus will stimulate more of the brain tissue. And that would be quite different to if you are wanting to decrease arousal and decrease agitation, for example. The use of musical syntax can be really useful to increase responses in children. So from the early childhood years at a pre-conscious level, children implicitly understand the rules of Western music. And there are theories that this that it is actually the manipulation of this syntax that supports our anticipation and emotional responses to music. So it might be that manipulating musical expectancies can create an increase in arousal. This could be leaving a space when there is an expected cadence point or briefly using an unexpected melodic note or harmonic progression. With neurologically vulnerable populations, the potential for overstimulation and cognitive, cognitive fatigue is high though, and does need to be at the forefront of our minds because processing music is going to require energy. 
So if we think about the manipulation of musical syntax in clinical scenarios, I'm going to introduce another case study. So let me introduce you to a child who we will call Evie again, not her real name. So Evie was a 10 year old child who was involved in a school bus accident. She had a GCS of six at the scene, indicating a severe brain injury. Um, and I have listed some of her other imaging results for those of you who are interested um, in that information. These results clearly indicate the extensive and extremely severe nature of her TBI. So Evie was in the ICU in the intensive care unit for 18 days for which she required life sustaining therapies, including um, ventilation. And during that time, she underwent multiple surgeries and other procedures to reduce the impact and severity of the secondary brain injuries. She also had a tracheostomy tube um, inserted to help with her breathing. As part of a small research project, we video recorded 10 music therapy sessions with, um, with Evie, and we then micro analyzed her behaviors in two of these sessions. So we watched the videos in five second epochs and micro analyzed her behavioral responses. The first of these recorded music therapy sessions was held about 19 days after her admission to the hospital. Um, at this stage, she was out of intensive care um, and in being cared for in the acute neurosurgical unit. She was presenting with a disorder of consciousness that aligned with a UWS presentation. So she was spontaneously opening her eyes, but not fixing or following. She was not following verbal commands. She was producing some vocalizations through a speaking valve in her tracheostomy, but these did not appear to be purposeful. She had a significant right hemiplegia and presented with dystonic movements in her left arm and she had lip smacking movements, so a, sort of a repetitive chewing mouth movement. She had periods of being unsettled, which corresponded with an increase in blood pressure and heart rate. The gorgeous Evie was a big ABBA fan, so her parents reported that she loved ABBA and had loved ABBA for many years. In these early stages of her recovery, I used familiar song with the intention of stimulating arousal and awareness to maximize her consciousness and ultimately support her longer term cognitive and functional recovery. So I started playing, um, well, actually I started the session with a simple hello song, um, introducing more complex stimuli. So starting with voice and then progressing to, um, to including her name in that, and as well as a, a guitar accompaniment. But when I, I first introduced the ABBA song, I played a simple accompaniment pattern on the guitar. So I just strummed on the beat. And the intention of this was to highlight the temporal organization inherent in the song. Um, and it was during the singing of Waterloo, which was her favorite song that she initially stilled. So there was a decrease in her dystonic arm movements and the lip smacking movements stopped. So I played Waterloo at a steady, consistent tempo. But then what we observed um, as the session progressed, so um, sort of after one or two repetitions of Waterloo, was that at key moments in the songs, and it was often where the chorus leads into the verse, we observed a response. And it was a repeated response. So repeated responses are very important in the disorder of consciousness population because they indicate there is um, some cognitive mediation of the response indicating a higher level of arousal and awareness. So it was at the point of when the lyrics, um, the history book on the shelf is always repeating itself and it leads into the Waterloo, couldn't escape if I wanted to. So at that, at that point, the history book on the shelf is always repeating itself. I slowed the, my singing, I slowed the tempo of the song and I left space for Evie to respond. Um, and I slowed the song to create a sense of anticipation. And what we observed in these moments in this familiar song was that she did consistently respond. So there was an initial stilling followed by a big inhalation an increased muscle tension in her left arm. She slightly, she pulled up her legs under the sheets and this was followed by a big exhale and a vocalization and a total body relaxation. So what we observed was that there was this whole body recruitment for the vocalization in key moments in the songs. So in this session, this was really important because the nursing and other allied health staff had reported that the only stimulus Evie was responding to was pain. So what we saw here was a meaningful and consistent response to an, an emotionally salient stimulus for a child with a very, with a very severe brain injury. But, um, in this session, so music was successful in increasing arousal and awareness and responsiveness, but that's quite different to the next example and the next session in which Evie was quite agitated. 
So in this next session, which was about 10 days after the one I just described, um, Evie was still not fixing or following. She was not following verbal commands nor displaying functional movements, but she was quite agitated and there was a thrashing movement of her left arm and quite a guttural cry. So she'd had a tracheostomy removed at this point, but her cry wasn't um, altered with family members talking to her. She didn't seem to have settled with pain medications. Um, and because of this agitation, her sleep was negatively impacted and that's a vicious cycle of um, less sleep, more agitated, more agitated, less sleep. So based on her increased responsiveness in previous sessions, um, I started the session with an ABBA song with a simple guitar accompaniment and, and it was actually a total disaster. <laughs> so she became more agitated. It was a total music therapy fail. She was overstimulated given her pre-existing level of agitation the the familiar song with the lyrics and the melodic and the harmonic component was just too stimulating so i put the guitar down and rather than a harmonic accompaniment i held her hand and tapped the rhythm knowing that rhythm is a simpler um, component of music to process so i sang the lyrics at a steady pace tapping the beat um, I didn't alter the pace. I did not want to create anticipation or musical expectancy. And what we observed was actually a pause in her agitation. So her vocalizations ceased. There was a pause in the thrashing arm movements and an overall relaxation in her face and body. So this relaxation was initially only maintained for the duration of the song, but nonetheless, it was a significant respite in her agitated state. And as she progressed further in her recovery, we were able to extend the periods for which um, she was relaxed, including settling her to sleep. So um, it was the same patient and the same use of familiar music, but very different manipulations of the music for quite different therapeutic outcomes aligned with um, Evie's recovery and the progression through disorders of consciousness. So we, we know, certainly as music therapists, we know that music is an amazing therapeutic tool because it is a rich experience. It's not just a stimulus. And often part of that experience is um, the memory associations that we have with particular music, but also if we're providing an in-person or a one-on-one -on -one music therapy intervention, the interpersonal connection is so important in what we do. And as I just described with Evie, it's, it's the live the live presentation of music that means we are able to adapt it in the moment in response to the person we are working with to maximize the therapeutic out outcomes. This leads to an important critique of the information included in the systematic review that I've presented. And this is that many of the included studies use music in um, ideal laboratory conditions to, cert to test a certain hypothesis. So this meant that music was a deconstructed auditory stimulus. Um, and that's quite different to the music that we would use in therapeutic contexts. So we intentionally included a very broad definition of what music is in the review so that we could include as much data as possible. But a lot of the studies did use pure tones um, or an oddball paradigm where strings of single pitches are presented with the um, infrequent presentation of a different pitch. So this is really not the music experiences, the musical interactions, the musical stimuli that we would use in music therapy sessions. Um, I don't know if you've ever listened to pure tones, but they're actually quite unpleasant to listen to. So um, I guess in a, in a lot of these studies, the richness of music as an experience wasn't present. So we know absolutely that more research is definitely needed. Um, my colleagues and I are currently undertaking uh, EEG analysis of some data that we've recorded in conscious children to them listening to a familiar song as a more complete music experience because familiar song includes melody, harmony, rhythm, timbre, lyrics, etc. But we haven't yet got to the bottom of that analysis and we are hoping to present the results of that study um, or at least have them published early next year, hopefully at the latest. So that's all I have for the presentation. Um, when I practiced it yesterday, I came in at 48 minutes, which indicates that I've absolutely rushed through it this time. Um, however, that gives us more time for questions. So I'm going to stop the recording now and we can switch over to um, a live question format. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Janine, for such an information-packed <laughs> lecture. Um, and uh, just to, to let people know that um, it's, I don't know, you can comment on this, but sometimes um, it is possible for people to share the slides, but also that the sessions are recorded. Um, and uh, it was really great um, to hear all of that. I, I could kick off just to ask you if you could say a little bit more about the Western music um, discussion. So mm -hmm. obviously I haven't seen um, all the articles that you referred to that you reviewed. So I suppose my question is um, to arrive at the conclusion that people innately have a response to Western music, if I understood you correctly, is that mm -hmm. people from any culture across the world or is this within the western culture in western so it would be children that are enculturated to western music so those that have been exposed to western music um probably from birth and this is where there's so much information uh there's a lot of information available but there's a lot of information missing um and what the studies did was look at um expectations um violations of expectations of harmony so they would play harmonic progressions and then violate that harmony and see and look for very particular um, responses, brain responses. So um, an early right anterior negativity is the, the exact response they would look for in that response and then track that that response starts to occur consistently um, in about four to five year olds. And that's even before the children will behaviorally indicate that they are aware that that wasn't the harmon harmony that they're expecting in that. So um, unfortunately, it was beyond the scope of that literature to look at, uh, or at this literature review to look mm. at other cultures. We would expect, I guess, different brain responses. Yeah, thank you so much. And I'm going to hand over now to Naomi. We're, we've got at least four questions in the Q&A. There might be time for, for more, so keep them coming. Um, Yes, so we've got a question from Elizabeth Howe. She asks, can you repeat the difference of sensitivity to melody and harmony in under six months age infants, please? Mm -hmm. um, sure, I can. Um, that is a good question. And I think that one of the things to note is that um, we don't actually know what the lived experiences of the babies listening to melody and harmony are. So what we're, what we're doing is extrapolating from electrical brain responses to what that might be. But the main thing is, is that the responses just take longer to mature. So at birth, um, the studies basically put electrodes on the, on the baby's heads and played a series of, of um, pure tones with, um, with a variation in tones and again looked for a very specific auditory response. So that was captured to, to melody, to very simple stimulus, stimuli in, in newborn babies in um, when they were exposed to harmonic um, progressions that just the responses were recorded a little bit more slowly. So they were recorded, but they took they sort of took longer to be captured at the electrodes and the baby's brains recruited more brain tissue to have the same response. So I guess that's, that's worth thinking about if we're working with infants into how much stimulation we're providing, I guess, even neurologically healthy infants, let alone infants who may have had a perinatal brain injury, mm -hmm. um, that it, it does take a lot of brain tissue. And the electrical brain responses are, I mean, they're recorded in, in milliseconds and microseconds. So they're still occurring very quickly. It's what probably we'd think to be close enough to instantaneous, but it just does take a little bit longer for those brain messages to get through to the scalp. Great, measured, thank I think it's more yet to be measured at the scalp. Thank you. And we've got a question from Alex Street. He asks, is there any literature in your review on using pre-recorded music for arousal adjustment or any personal clinical experience in implementing this, either in your sessions or for implementation by other staff between sessions? That is a good question and a very big question. Uh, <laughs> um, the answer is not that we included in the systematic review, primarily because we excluded um, clinical populations to look at, at how neurotypical children would respond to music. Do I have clinical experience? Um, 
Certainly, yes. I, I um, remember working with a particular child who the neuropsychologist would always schedule their assessments after a music therapy session. So we would have sort of a short 15 minute music therapy session. The child was about six, um, not presenting in a disorder of consciousness. And, and we would use music to increase their arousal to a point that they would concentrate then for a sufficient period of time. Often some of the neuropsych assessments sort of take 60 to 90 minutes to, to complete that. I know there is also quite a significant body of work in the disorder of consciousness population, um, considering using music and salient stimulus to increase arousal for the current evidence is in adults, um, using familiar music to increase arousal so that when they undertake the other behavioural based assessment, they may get um, a, a better indicator of the individual's actual level of consciousness. Um, yeah, based on, on I guess, the, the individual being in the, the optimal state of cognitive arousal. So there is certainly a lot more research to be done with that population. Great, thank you. Um, we've got a question here um, from Florencia Grasselli. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Um, they are practicing in Bahrain at the moment. And so that's very interesting information. Um, they wondered how many of those articles reviewed were involving a music therapist? Um, none. So this was based on the music neuroscience data. So we were very much looking at, um, um, I guess it, it's looking at, at quite the neurologic music therapy model. So how would we develop music therapy interventions based on what we know about how music is processed in the brain and then how we would apply that knowledge to clinical populations. So this particular study was, um, or the, the interventions in this study were very much um, neuroscience based. Um, as I say, so I've just undertaken a very small study where we have used, it's very much in a neuroscience model, but we have used whole music. So rather than the deconstructed auditory stimuli of pure tones um, or oddball paradigms, um, we have presented the children with spoke um with song whole songs so me singing with guitar accompaniment similar to what we would do in a music therapy session um we're just waiting on the final analysis of that but yes unfortunately none of these studies <laughs> thank you um we've got another question from jonathan Poole. he asks how have the findings from your systematic review related to your clinical practice at the hospital did you change anything about it or did it just confirm what you suspected? Hi, Jonathan. <laughs> um, um, we, I think a little bit of both. I think that's a really good question. I think um, as, as music therapists, we are very in tune with how we manipulate music. And I think that's often a term that doesn't sit particularly comfortable. Uh, I think if you're um, particularly trained more psychodynamically or psychoanalytically, but we certainly use music in ways based on our observations of the clients that we work with. So I think how the systematic review has changed that is just being really consciously aware. So at times I actually might approach clinical, um, clinical work with children with disorders of consciousness, I guess um, a little bit more rigorously potentially aligned with some of the work too is of the Matadoc and the music care assessment tools in introducing a single stimulus first, whether it just be um, a, a single tone or humming a note before I would introduce language, or also potentially having a look at some of this, the children's scans. Um, we are fortunate at the Children's Hospital, we have a fabulous electronic me medical record systems where we can look up scans um, and have a look at, at where their brain injury might be located. So having a think about um, how diffuse the brain injury is, or is it localised? Um, is there significant damage in um, like cerebellum? Would we expect, therefore, rhythm processing to be very difficult for this young person? So I guess just being um, far more conscious of, of how we would apply significant musical elements and a little bit more systematic in how I would use some of those. Um, of course, what we know is that people never actually respond like we would expect them to based on textbook knowledge as well. So there is still a lot of absolute responding in the moment to, to the person we are working with. Thank you, that's great. We've got a couple more questions. I think we we'll probably have time for them both quickly yeah. and then. Yes, great. But only those probably. Okay, great. So Ella Moxon has asked, 
would babies would babies perhaps familiar songs maybe that's recognize or prefer familiar songs that they heard in utero is this something that you could use or exploit for more research in young babies i'm going to um start my answer to that question with uh, a claim that I'm not a NICU music therapist. Um, <laughs> so, so my experience is definitely not in NICU and I think there is um, mm. some really great research out there internationally. There's some fabulous studies going on in, in NICU. So that's a really good question. Um, certainly there is evidence that babies do respond to music that they heard in utero. Um, yeah, I guess at which point we would need to introduce music in utero and how much for that baby to become familiar. Um, can you just repeat the second part of that question for me? Yes. Um, so is this something that you could use or exploit for more research in young babies? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think there's a lot to be done um, with too is that is that obviously it would what would be the aim of what the music intervention is or what the research is? Are we look at, looking at calming? Are we looking at increasing their responsiveness? Are we looking at social skills or are we looking at um, hospital-based NICU populations? But yeah, absolutely, I think there would be a lot. And also a lot, um, what I think too would be fascinating is how long does it take a baby to become familiar with a song? What's the exposure required for that? If we introduce something at birth, at what point would they then recognize that as a familiar piece. I suspect it's quite quickly and I think there is some evidence that that occurs fairly quickly. But yeah, certainly I think there's research to be done on that as well. Great, thank you. And just a quick one at the end. Um, Claire Wood has asked, what if any standardized assessments are you using for children who present as having a disorder of consciousness? Uh, currently there are no standardised assessments <laughs> for children with disorders of consciousness. Uh, Jonathan Poole and Wendy McGee are working very hard on that to introduce um, the, the Musica, which is a paediatric adaptation. I don't know whether Jonathan can be pinned and introduce a little bit about that. I can, he's there. I, can, I can try. <laughs> I, I think I can try. Jonathan, can I invite you just to have the last word? Oh no, I don't know how to do it. <laughs> Let me try. Kira. I think, oh, here he is. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Right, yeah. okay. Um, that, no, um, yeah, uh, thank you for mentioning the, the music, Ginny. <laughs> so, um, well, Claire Wood actually, she works at the Children's Trust. Um, so you know, she knows the, the music very well. She's used it, one of the few that uh, she was there, uh, partly uh, at the beginning of it, really, in helping us develop it. So. For those of you that don't know um, what it is, it's it's a paediatric version of the Matadoc, which was developed at the Royal Hospital for Neurodisability. And it's an assessment tool that allows us to try to work out as best we can um, from a, a behavioral point of view, um, uh, the level of awareness uh, and the level of responsiveness to stimuli that uh, children with disorders of consciousness um, can function at. And that helps us plan for their rehabilitation, for their goal planning, and um, their care planning, and their treatment planning, which then allows us to optimise really and maximise their potential for recovery. Great, thanks, Jonathan. Um, Jonathan works with collaborators in America and also is um, in other places in the UK and is part of symptom. Just for anyone who doesn't know, <laughs> um, hence it was great uh, to have this discussion from. From you all. Thank you so much, Janine. Um, we do we do have to close in a couple of minutes um, and we do have to round off there and um, we might be able to see the Q&A afterwards and it, it might be possible we can answer your questions if they haven't yet been answered. So we will do our best to do that. Um, thank you and apologies for any technical issues. Um, we will iron those out for next time. Um, but I really want to thank you, Janine, for such um, a thought-provoking and, and interesting and um, information-packed lecture, which um, I think is, uh, is not such a mainstream approach, perhaps in some countries like the UK, but maybe we'll 
will develop and expand um, from this really um, sort of motivating research that you're all undertaking and you in particular and all the best and thank you so much for coming in the middle of the night as well <laughs> thank you for having me yes as the australian time zone doesn't work well for <laughs> international presentations yeah. thank so you very much for having me um i have provided the slides and my email address is on those slides so i'm more than happy if people have specific questions later on to to shoot me through an email thanks so much janine i'm just going to hand back to naomi for the final word Thank you. Thank you. Just a reminder that after the webinar, you'll be sent a survey. So it'd be great to hear feedback from everybody. And um, we will be delighted to have you to join us for our next webinar, which is on the 14th of November. And Jelly, Gemma Kelly will be presenting on rhythmic auditory stimulation for gait training in paediatric neurorehabilitation. So still in our paediatric area for this term. And you'll be sent more information on this and the link to register from SIMTA. Um, and we hope to see you all at our next our next webinar. Thank you, everyone. Bye to all. Yeah. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. Bye, everyone.